Welcome everybody to a new work from Jörg Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth in collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Again, we are working together to bring you a study that is in this way unheard of in the world, especially unheard of in the world of quote unquote Christians. The study that we are going to do is based on a comment that somebody wrote on a video that I mirrored a few years ago concerning um, Daniel chapter 9 and the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel by Jesus Christ utterly and completely 2000 years ago. That man wrote a comment in which he showed New Testament verses that confirm word by word everything that was said in Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 and he went through a few if not to say numerous um, um. citations from the New Testament like the book of John and first John and wherever and you're gonna see that in our study we are going to do that in a moment and this study is called the New Testament confirms Daniel 70th week prophecy now I'm not going to do all the explanation because I know that Tom is anxiously waiting to tell you not only our motivation to do this, but also to tell you the whole background that concerns a study that has been actually started years ago. So I'm very glad that I can warmly again uh, welcome my brother in Christ Tom Fress from the United States of America from Inquisition Update. Hello Tom to the broadcast and uh, Please let us hear your thoughts before we go into the study. Hello, Yerk, and hello to all the listeners. I want to begin by um, telling the listeners that this is not an exhaustive study. What I'm, what I'm hoping will uh, result from this discussion and the presenting of these, scripture pass these scriptural passages is to um, uh, encourage the listeners to do their own scriptural analysis of the New Testament to find uh, more and more and more conf uh, confirmation, written confirmation in the New Testament of the perfect and complete fulfillment of all 70 of the uh, 70 weeks of Daniel. And the purpose of this is to destroy any holding to what is known as the futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, that being 
that there is some portion or any portion of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy yet to be fulfilled in the future. Listen, if our Messiah, how he's referred to in Daniel's prophecy is Messiah the Prince, if he completely and perfectly fulfilled every uh, demand of, of, of Daniel's 70-week prophecy, and if the vision and the prophecy is sealed up, that means it's been rolled up like a scroll, and a, a seal has been placed upon it, that means it's finished. It's over. All 70 weeks. It's been perfectly and completely fulfilled. Not one thing left undone. Then we must conclude that any talk of a future fulfillment of any portion of Daniel's prophecy is tantamount to illegally opening that scroll, removing the prophetic seal off of the vision and the prophecy, unrolling the scroll and duplicating it someplace. Listen, when a record is sealed up and placed in holding in storage, no one has the authority to open a sealed document. I mean, look, we all know that our government seals documents, all right? And no one has authority to open sealed documents until permission is given. In this case, the Bible says it's going to be sealed up. The vision and the prophecy is going to be sealed up. And that means it's finished. It's over. Okay? I'm suggesting to you, and common sense demands, that if the 70 weeks of Daniel has been perfectly and completely fulfilled, and the vision and the prophecy has been rolled up like a scroll and sealed, then that means it is illegal. A trans, it's a transgression to break the seal on that vision and that prophecy and to amend it in any way by delaying or projecting any portion of that, of that prophecy into the future. Now, if you understand after this reading, after this reading, that that vision has been perfectly and completely fulfilled, the scroll has been rolled up and sealed, then you must conclude, as do I and as do Yerk and, uh, and an increasing number of people in the Christian world, that any talk of a future fulfillment is an outright lie. And it's assault. It's an assault against the author of this prophecy. It's an assault against the Messiah who fulfilled it. And it's an assault against the God of heaven who sent him to redeem us. All right. That is what we must conclude. Or we've wasted our time. And you can continue to, to believe in a lie. Futurism. All right. Again, I want to reiterate, this is only a partial study. There's more to do, and it should be a challenge to all the listeners to do their own study their own, and see for themselves with their own eyes, their own confirmation that every portion of Daniel's prophecy has been perfectly and completely fulfilled. And if you cannot prove on your own that Daniel's prophecy and every element of it has been perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ, then you must consider the prophet Daniel to be a liar, that the vision and the prophecy is not sealed up, and that there's still more of that prophecy to be fulfilled. The scroll is still open. Okay? That's what you must do if you're a futurist. You must say, Daniel lied. Daniel didn't tell us the truth. Daniel didn't tell us everything. And Jesus or the Antichrist is going to fulfill some other portion of this of this prophecy that Jesus already fulfilled. Okay, it's the only conclusion you could come to. 
that either Daniel fouled up or Gabriel fouled up or Jesus our Messiah fouled up or God fouled up. That's the only conclusion you can draw from coming to another conclusion than the one we are aiming at. All right, here's another aspect of this that I wish to convey. My regular listeners will recognize this. But the New Testament, I want you to see it for the first time in your life, most likely, that the New Testament is the infallible historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70-week prophecy recorded in chapter 9 of his prophecies. Chapter 9 is perfectly and completely fulfilled by Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago. That's what the New Testament is. Remember, he came to confirm a covenant with many for one week. All right? That is the New Testament, the new covenant in his blood, that remission of sins is a done deal. Okay? He's made perfect reconciliation between man and God. All who believe in him, uh, it, it, it says he give the power to become the sons of God, right? All right? So this is the covenant that he's made, and it's a, uh, he, he will not rescind this covenant. This is a, a one-sided covenant, and God never breaks his covenants. Man always breaks the covenants. But in this case, man has nothing to perform except to just receive the gift. Salvation is a gift. It's confirmed in this covenant in writing. It cannot be rescinded. It has been perfectly and completely fulfilled. Otherwise, the covenant has not been confirmed. All right. I hope everybody understands that. If there was anything left undone by Messiah the Prince on the cross 2,000 years ago, then this covenant has not been confirmed. Now, listen, if you continue to believe in futurism, that's what you're saying, that this covenant has not been confirmed. Jesus somehow failed in his mission, and you are yet in your sins, and you will die in your sins, okay? You've believed in vain. That is not the case. You have to make a decision. Either Daniel's prophecy is perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ, Messiah the Prince, 2,000 years ago, or we are yet in our sins and we have believed in vain. That's what this really all boils down to. That's why this is so important for us to study. So you must see for yourself so that you can confirm in your own mind, in your own heart, that there's nothing left of Daniel's prophecy yet to be fulfilled. It's sealed up. There's nothing of it to be fulfilled in the future. Otherwise, Jesus is not the Messiah. He didn't perform his job. We are yet in our sins. You see how important this is? It's absolutely essential for every Bible-believing Christian to know that Jesus, Messiah the Prince, came 2,000 years ago at the beginning of the 70th and final week that he was anointed in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. And in the midst of that week, after three and a half years, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. He made reconciliation for iniquity. He put an end of sin. He brought in everlasting righteousness, an everlasting kingdom, and reconciled us to God. Put an end of sin. Is it starting to sink in? Our salvation is a done deal. And if any portion of the 70th and final week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled in the future, then we are yet in our sins. No sin has been recon no reconciliation has been made between man and God. The covenant is not made. The covenant is te is tenuous at best. And we are yet in our sins, and every Christian that has died over the last 2,000 years has believed in vain. I hope I've made the point. 
And now you can begin to understand who it is really who teaches a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. They want to deny that Jesus is the Christ. They want to deny that we are yet in our sins, that Jesus was not the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. The prophecy has not been confirmed. It has not been fulfilled. The seal has been broken. It's yet to be fulfilled in the future, and yet they'll even insist that you believe that the covenant will be fulfilled by a future antichrist for pity's sake. Blindness, darkness taught in all the churches today. And you're not to believe it. The truth makes far more sense. And uh, it's confirmed voluminously with scrupulous detail in the New Testament. Again, the New Testament, I want you to see it this way for the first time in your life. The New Testament is virtually a r infallible historical written record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. Our sins have been washed away. We have been made reconciled unto God by Christ Jesus' blood in the covenant that he made. It is finished. It's fulfilled. It's a done deal. The, the vision and the prophecy have been rolled up and sealed, and no one has an authority to open up that scroll. And if you doubt any portion of this, you placed your own salvation in jeopardy. Now we'll begin the study. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I think um, it is also important to mention the point that um, we Oh, I prepared this paper based on a comment that was um, written under a video I mirrored a few years ago. And those are the first verses of the King James Bible that we are going to discuss today. But Tom and I, we have been in a private Bible study for the last, I think, about four years, huh? being now the September 2020. I think we started somewhere in 2016, if not even 2015. I, I, I just don't remember because it took us so much time. Almost every Saturday, Sabbath evening that is, without any interruption as far as I can remember for the last years, Tom and I came together in a private Bible study and we analyzed and read the New Testament with the understanding that the papacy is the Antichrist, Jesus is the Christ, and he fulfilled Daniel 70's week utterly and completely 2,000 years ago. From that standpoint on, we studied the New Testament. And therefore, you have to understand that the study we are going to present to you, these video and the coming videos, probably in the future, have no script that we prepared. The only script that we have is this one. And this is a PDF of, as you can see, seven pages. And this is just the comment of a man who commented on one of my videos and proves to you with New Testament verses, as you can see, John, 1 John, Isaiah, and so on. Isaiah, of course, is the Old Testament, but that's one of the um, rare, uh, uh, how do you say that, uh, exclusions of the New Testament, that you can also have an Old Testament uh, verse, because Jesus Christ also fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament that were speaking of him in the New Testament, of course. So that's why here, for example, Isaiah 53 is mentioned. Isaiah 53 is the quote-unquote forgotten chapter. Uh, the Jews do not know that chapter. And we know from our study, uh, if you follow that, of course, of the end-time delusions, that Paul called to the Christians of today in Romans chapter 11, verse 11, that we have to provoke the Jews to jealousy because the Jews have been betrayed by their scribes and their Pharisees as we are betrayed by our scribes and Pharisees of today, not understanding that the 70th week of Daniel is utterly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So the Bible study that Tom and I did for the last few years, and we are not done with that yet because we are still going through the book of Revelation, and this is a study that's going to take a few years in itself, but that's another point I don't want to speak about right now because it's a subject of today. Um, Tom said that this video or these videos should take you to take out your Bible and read the Bible with the understanding that 
Jesus Christ fulfilled Daniel chapter 9 utterly and completely 2,000 years ago. We are taking these verses from this comment at the first and then afterwards we go probably into some verses or some chapters or even uh, some, some books in the Bible um, and, see, and show to you what we did in our study the last few years. This is not scripted. Therefore, we see where the Spirit takes us with telling you this and hoping that you, along with us, do your own studies because one thing is sure, dear listener, the truth that you seek out for yourself is the only truth that you can 100% accept. Not the truth that Tom Fress tells you, not the truth that Jörg Lissmann tells you, but the truth the Holy Spirit leads you into. I think that's a very important point before we go into the well study. Well said, well said. So, I'm going to read this now and Tom will interrupt me whenever it is appropriate for him. This new study called, as we said, the New Testament confirms Daniel chapter 9, or as I just changed the name for the playlist, the New Testament confirms Daniel's 70-week prophecy, because that's even more to the point. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 reads, and these words in blue are from the King James Version of the Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 in this case. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and. And now we go into a few Bible verses to confirm what Daniel was told by the archangel Gabriel in this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. When we read first uh, when we when we read John chapter 1 verse 29 it says quote the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb, or saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Well, what does Daniel 9.24 say? To finish the transgression. What is to, ta what is, uh, to finish the transgression? That is to take away the sin of the world. Right? Yeah. What is sin? The transgression of the law. We would not know sin were it not for the law. Transgression of the law is sin. That's the definition of sin. If there is no, if there is no law, then there is no sin. But Jesus came to take away the sin. He came to take away the transgression of the law. So, it's one, one verse confirming the mission of Messiah the Prince was to take away the sin of the world, to make an end of sins, to finish the transgression. In other words, bring transgression to a, an end. All right, and here is written record, historical, infallible, I will add, infallible historical recording of the, full, the fulfillment of that portion of Daniel's scripture w prophecy when he says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay? No future fulfillment in that or we're all in trouble. Is that, isn't that understandable? If Christ hasn't sufficiently put an end of sin, then there is no reconciliation for iniquity and we are yet in our sins. The New Testament perfectly and completely histor records the historical record, the perfect and complete record of Jesus' fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Go ahead, Yerk. Also, uh, Tom, it is the Apostle Paul who said, I think in the epistle uh, of the Romans, where he said, uh, I wouldn't have known sin if it wasn't for the law. That's right. Only when you are familiar with the law, you know whether you adhere to the law or whether you break the law. That's right. So that means that without law, there is no sin. That's right. So what... Now, Tom, this... Sorry, but this is a sentence we have to go into. <laughs> you know where this is leading to, right? What does the Antichrist, the papacy, teach us today? Papacy there says is no law. And therefore, yeah, well, there's not. no transgression, and you don't need a Messiah, right? 
That's right, and they contradict themselves. They say there is no law, and then they turn around and say that you have to confess your sins to a priest. <laughs> what sins if there's no law? That, that's how much confusion there is in the Roman Catholic churches. And okay. in the Protestant churches also. Well, they're they're more Roman Catholic than they are Protestant these days. <laughs> that's right, yeah. It's very important that you keep in mind, without knowing the law, you don't know whether you sin or not. That's right. That's why God wrote his law in tables of stone. So you do not have an excuse. You know they are written in there. And when you are a born-again Christian, the law is written in your heart. Anyway, 1 John 3, 5. So, 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. The Bible says, And ye know that he, speaking of Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. This is also a very, very important point to understand that Jesus Christ is the only man who up to today ever walked the earth who did not know sin. Even though he was tried. Oh, he was tried. You can read that in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4 when the devil tries to um, get Jesus to sin and get Jesus to... Um, worship him instead of the Father in heaven. And it's very interesting that just today I saw a video in German about the uh, heresy that is taught in all the churches today of the Trinity. Because the Trinity is a pagan um, uh, a, a, a pagan um, invention uh, and a pagan teaching. Yeah? And that man in the video, it was a German video, made very, very clear, Jesus gave up his godly status in heaven, came in the flesh of the same flesh that we men are all made of, not the flesh of his mother, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches, because Mary was, quote-unquote, uh, what are the words, um, False doctrine, the uh, false Roman Catholic doctrine known as the Immaculate Conception. Im immaculate of Conception, yeah. She was born without sin, so she was not of the flesh that every man in the world is made of. And Jesus Christ was born out of her, and he was made of the same immaculate flesh as she is, so he was not the flesh of ours. And that is a wrong Roman Catholic teaching. So that man in the video made it very clear that Jesus Christ gave up his godly status in heaven went to earth, being born in the flesh, being tried as we all, but still without sin. If that wasn't the case, he could not have been our Messiah. And right. also, the Bible and, describes him as the second Adam. And we know the first Adam was made of the same flesh that we're made of. How could Jesus be the second Adam if he were not made of the same flesh? How could he be tested and tempted just like we all are and yet without sin, if he was somehow yet divine in his flesh, divine in his being, incapable of sin. That is not the truth. That's Roman Catholic teaching, and it's being taught more and more in the Protestant and evangelical churches, that somehow Jesus was free of original sin, and, was, and he got his sinlessness from his mother. That's Roman Catholic doctrine and dogma, that is Antichrist doctrine and dogma. You can better understand how Jesus re uh, redeemed us because he was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. He was capable of sinning because he lived in the same sinful flesh that we are made of, yet he sinned not. That's what made him the perfect spotless lamb suitable for the sacrifice that would take place three and a half years after his baptism. That's how we are redeemed. That's how Jesus became the second Adam. The first Adam, sin entered in the world. The second Adam, 
sin was accounted for. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, the man in the video said how we all die in one man, Adam. We are all born again in one man, and that's Jesus Christ. That's right. Death came into the world, and uh, death by sin. And death by Adam. one man, and by another man, yep. we were quickened to life again. That's right. If it was, if it was capable for man to uh, receive death through the first Adam, then it's just it's righteous and just that a righteous man should bring us all back to life. And uh, Jesus accomplished that salvation for us. And we all we have to do is receive it. It's a gift. All right, back to you. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression. And Isaiah says in chapter 53, verse 12 of his book, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Yep. There's made our intercessor. He made intercession for the transgressors. To finish yeah. the transgression. Yeah, and here's an example of, of a passage in the Old Testament. And we were we focused primarily on the New Testament, but we can't exclude these remarkable passages in the Old Testament that confirm what we read in the New Testament. Again, reiterating that the New Testament, if properly understood, is the infallible historical written record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, known as the 70 weeks of Daniel. And uh, even in the Old Testament, we see how Christ is that fulfillment. Okay, Yerk. And to make an end of sins. Yeah? So, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Now we turn into the New Testament again, and we turn into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Quote, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. To make an end of sins. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Because in real biblical life, the blood of man is demanded for the payment of the sin, right? It says the wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ had to die because he took upon him all of our sins. He had to die. Jesus Christ was dead three days and three nights. He was as dead as all the others. No, his soul didn't survive here and there. No, he didn't go down to Hades in that time or anywhere else. He was dead. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Here, 1 Corinthians 15.3 refers to Isaiah 53, verse 12, that we just read. And it proves that because Jesus Christ went to the cross, he made an end of sins at the cross for us. All sins taken away by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, Tom, you have a point here? Well, uh, the obvious... Uh, yeah. Jesus didn't die for his own sins because he knew no sin. Yeah, he didn't sin. so uh, he, he must have died for our sins, didn't he? Just like Daniel prophesied. And uh, more confirmation that the New Testament is the historical record of the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Go ahead. I, I think, Tom, you are um, mentioning the very profound point. If Jesus Christ had sinned himself, he could not have died for our sins. That's right. It's impossible for a man who is a sinner to, 
to die for the sins of somebody else or even okay. or even no let, let's even be more clear about that to take away the sins of another man is impossible right. for a man who is a sinner himself now yeah. what does that do to the roman catholic teaching of a priest who absolves you of your sins because you go into the confession box uh -huh. a sinful depraved priest cannot save man, cannot redeem him from his sins, cannot absolve him from his sins. And take also the Roman Catholic teaching called the Vicar of Christ, that, that every pope in succession from the first to the last observe, reserves to himself the title Vicar of Christ, which means the replacement of the Son of God. In other words, the replacement of Jesus on the earth. Now, who would even want to replace Jesus? I'm quite happy with the one God gave us. But the Pope claims that he is the replacement of Jesus on the earth. But you can't name one Pope in all of history that wasn't morally bankrupt, desperately wicked, historically accounted. His sins all lie always before him. History is replete with the depraved, debauched lives of the popes. There was never a good pope, as I've heard some people say. Any man, any sinful, uh, depraved man who thinks to sit on a throne called God in this world and to think to forgive sins and to replace Christ in this world is a gigantic, rather a cosmic, Liar. Okay. Or a universal liar, Tom. That's right, a universal <laughs> liar. He is the manifestation of evil and wickedness in this world. And every pope has taken upon himself the title, Vicar of Christ, and even other blasphemous titles that mark him unequivocally, unmistakably as the man of sin, the son of perdition. Even the titles that the popes have 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 arrogated to themselves, mark them unmistakably as the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. If there were no other evidence in the history of this world that the Pope is the Antichrist, but, that the, but of the titles alone that he arrogates to himself, that would be enough to convince any reasonable Bible-believing Christian, any spirit-filled Christian, who the Antichrist is. But you can walk up and down the streets of this country from, from, from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic, from the Canadian border to the Mexican border, and you can't find but a handful of, of Christians who can even begin to tell you who the Antichrist is. Most of them will tell you, oh, he hasn't come in the world yet. He won't come until the 70th week of Daniel which is at the end of time, just seven years or three and a half years before Christ's literal return. All of Christianity in this country is woefully deceived on the account of who the Antichrist is when he's been walking among us, ruling over the kings of the earth and slaughtering the saints of Almighty God for, for 1,500 years. It is, it is a testimony to the complete and total ignorance of Christians today that they do not know who the Antichrist is. The, the whole Christian world in this country and around the world are ignorant to the true identity of the Antichrist is literally a testimony to just how, de just how useless, let me use the term again, useless are the churches. Okay? They have failed to do their job. Yes, they all tell us about Jesus and how he became our Savior. That is first and foremost. But they failed to identify to us the one who we can expect to be the deceiver of God's saints, the Antichrist. And that's what I'm all about. I don't want anybody within the sound of my voice to be doubtful in the least about who the Antichrist is both in history and current and future. It is the papacy. Every pope in succession from the first to the last is the man of sin, the son of perdition, 
the beast, the Antichrist in his generation. And we've got 1,500 years of historical accounts, inarguable written history about the total depravity, no less the blasphemous lives of the man of sin, the popes of Rome, and you ought to know about it, and you ought to spend a good deal of your time searching the truth about the papacy and learning its doctrines, learning its teachings, learning its diabolical sins and all of its depravity, all of its false doctrine, all of its ruling over the kings of the earth, all of its killing of the saints, and drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. You ought to know it. And every pastor that serves in a church in this country has failed in his mission. If there's even a shred of doubt in your mind and in your heart who the Antichrist is, he has failed in his mission. He ought to deliver himself to the curb outside the front of the church, and you need to go find yourself a true God-fearing, spirit-filled, Bible-believing Christian that knows both prophecy and history, which records the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. There isn't one worthy of the name pastor in this country. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. That was a very important point we are making here. So, to make an end of sins is also confirmed in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. Quote, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. There's the word, the key word, reconcile. He made reconciliation for iniquity. He, gave, he brought peace between God and man. The great intercessor, the one who has healed all the wounds by his own precious blood. Jesus is the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Not one element of it is yet to be fulfilled. Back to you, Yerk. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 through 28, we read, quote, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. There you go. He made reckons, he, 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 he uh, confirmed a covenant with many for one week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, he confirmed that covenant with many by giving up his own life, a, a ransom for many. Okay? Scripture uses the very words out of Daniel's prophecy. Okay? Now, we know that the prophecy says that he made all sacrifices and oblations to cease. You've heard me say, you've heard Yerk say, there is no more sacrifice for sin. No more sacrifices at all. Jesus was the only sacrifice that could take away sin. And once that sin is taken away, there is no more need for sacrifices. And the, 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 the most obvious, the most in-your-face testimony to the error that pervades this entire Christian life, this entire Christian world, is the sacrifice of the Mass. Where it says in the Scripture in Hebrews chapter 9, he said, Then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Okay? Just like in the Old Testament times when they had to make offerings for sin, sin offerings and oblations, sacrifices and oblations, over and over and over. That's not the case in, 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 the, in the New Covenant in his blood. 
one sacrifice in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay? He appeared. He was manifest in the flesh. Men saw him. Men touched him. Men received his salvation. And he was with us, among us, made of the same flesh that we are, tempted in every way like as we are, yet without sin. He became the sacrifice for us. He sacrificed himself. In the midst of the week, he became the sacrifice and caused all sacrifices and oblations to cease. And where do we see? We see the whole Christian world, Protestant, Evangelical, Roman Catholic, the whole supposed Christian world is anxiously awaiting the Jews to build a new temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem to begin animal sacrifices again. Okay? What are they doing? If they offer a sacrifice of a lamb or a goat, they're denying the Christ that bought them. They're denying the salvation that Jesus gave them once and for all upon the cross. They are eating and drinking damnation to themselves, no less than a Roman Catholic who eats and drinks the Mass. There is no more sacrifice for sin. And if you want to positively identify a religious cult in this world, a false religious system, all you have to do is look for a sacrifice either a drink offering or a blood offering, you have found a master of deception. That's what the Roman Catholic system is. And let me remind you, let me warn all my listeners, what they are in the, what they are in the business of doing now is to transform the communion of the Protestant and evangelical churches to a sacrifice. It's no longer a remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the altar 2,000 years ago. The perfect sacrifice, the once and for all, all-sufficient, reconciling sacrifice and oblation on the cross of Calvary. They're trying to turn the, 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 the remembrance of that holy communion into another sacrifice. And that's exactly what the mass of the Roman Catholic Church is, another sacrifice. What in, in those terms alone, you can see that what it is, is a true rejection of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, the churches of this country, no matter what denominational name, they are all led by deceivers. And you have to get out of the churches I don't know any other safe way to tell you. Just get out of the churches. Where would Satan most like to destroy God's people? Well, where you would expect to find God's people in the churches. Okay? Satan has every center, lock, stock, and barrel. He owns them. He's not concerned about them. They're going to a crisis eternity. There's no repentance in them. What Satan seeks to do is to destroy God's people. And all he's got to do to destroy God's people is to make them perform another sacrifice, which is nothing but to say to Jesus' face, I reject the sacrifice that you made for me 2,000 years ago. I must redo that sacrifice some other way. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church does on a daily basis around this world multiple times a day. That's what the Jews are fixing to do in the new modern nation state of Israel when they build their temple, consecrate their temple and their priesthood and begin animal sacrifices again to eat and drink damnation to themselves no less than than is done in the Roman Catholic churches. And if you're a Protestant or evangelical, And you hear your pastor begin to talk about the bread and the wine like it's the Eucharist or a sacrifice or an instrument of grace. Don't walk. Run! Back to you, Yerk. Uh, In my opinion, Tom, there's also another very interesting part in this um, little verse of uh, Hebrews 9.26. It speaks of 
but now once in the end of the world. So that means that we have to understand that this time already is the end of the world. That means That's it's right. the last kingdom we are in. That's right. We were told by the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 7 about the coming, the coming kingdoms, heathen pagan kingdoms in this world and what will happen and then when the world will end, what will happen. I think, Tom, maybe for the end of our reading today, it is interesting for you to go a little bit into this point. Many people okay. who are following the futurist uh, teaching of the Roman Catholic Church think we are living in a quote-unquote uh, time of Jewish supremacy, or we are going into a, a Jewish kingdom. Yeah, The Jews are behind the quote-unquote new world order. The Jews are behind this and the Jews are behind that and there must be another Jewish kingdom. Where Daniel said very profoundly in chapter 2 where he talked of the uh, metal man statue in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had when he explained the dream to the king himself that there are four kingdoms. And I think, Tom, you would very much like to go into that for a few minutes for the end of this broadcast so that next time we can start uh, with a new uh, part of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, and that today you would go into the end of the world that is mentioned here in Hebrew 9 and what these kingdoms are. And I will provide a few pictures in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Well, what we're talking about is what the Bible refers to as the times of the Gentiles. And uh, the times of the Gentiles is given to us in pictorial form in Daniel's prophecy. Daniel prophesied in the, in the, in the fashion of a, the metal man image, I call it, a historical timeline or a futuristic timeline for the times of the Gentiles. It began with Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold. It went through the Medo-Persian Empire, the, the, the chest and thighs, uh, breasts of uh, silver. Then we had the, uh, uh, the, the Grecian Empire, represented by the, bron the brass, uh, the bronze, uh, thighs, and, uh, and, and uh, lower parts. And then finally, the fourth empire upon the earth would be the iron, the two iron legs. And after Jesus described, or rather, Jesus, through the prophet Daniel, described the, the history of, of the Gentile world and the Gentile empires on the face of the earth, what it's concluded by a stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands that strikes the image in the feet of it and grinds the entire image into powder and it blows away with the wind. Okay? That's how the time of the Gentiles ends with Christ's return. Okay, and that's going to be the end of the time of the Gentiles when Christ returns. Now, we know that the Roman Empire, that is the fourth and final beast that Daniel described, the two legs of iron and the feet and toes of iron and miry clay, the ten uh, 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 Roman uh, uh, nations that made up the Roman Empire, was in power before Jesus was born. So we had the very last Gentile empire on the earth functioning and ruling the world at the time of Jesus' birth. Okay? There is not going to be a fifth Gentile empire. The same empire that was ruling the world when Jesus was born is the same Roman Empire that rules the world today. Okay? Historians would love us to believe that the Roman Empire ended. It fell. You've heard the words? The, the, the fall of the Roman Empire? That is an out-and-out out lie. The Roman Empire never fell at all. It simply morphed into the quote-unquote holy Roman Empire under the popes. The Caesars, who were restraining the rise of the papacy, 
simply were taken out of the way, and then the man of sin, the holy Roman emperor, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the pope of Rome, was manifest in the world. And he's been manifest ever since. There is going to be, there is going to replace the Gentile world, Christ and his kingdom. He is the stone that was cut out of the mountains without hands that strikes the image in the feet in the end of the times of the Gentiles. We've already been through the head of gold, the shoulders and arms of silver, the 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 brazen uh, thighs and the iron legs and the feet and toes. And what comes after that is Christ. That fourth and final empire, the Roman Empire of iron, the two legs of iron, east and west, were in power when Jesus was on the earth. The only change that has taken place in that fourth and final Gentile world power it's simply been a transition between the Caesars of the pagan Roman Empire to the Caesar of the Holy Roman Empire, the papacy. And that's why Jesus said, Behold, this is the end time. This is the last time. So the last days began 2,000 years ago or more. It began with the rise of the fourth and final beast on the earth, the last ruling empire to rule the Gentiles until the coming of Christ. It's more than 2,000 years old now. It has never fallen. True, it has morphed a bit, but it has never fallen. And the center of that power was then Rome. The center of that power today is still Rome. And it will remain in Rome until Christ returns and destroys it with the brightness of his coming and the spirit of his mouth. And that's when all the martyrs of Jesus will be recompensed. Okay? That's a day we all gloriously await. But until that day comes, we are still subject to the persecution of and the total controlling power of that man of sin in Rome. And it's time for God's people to realize that the papacy rules as much over the kings of the earth today as did the Caesars rule over the kings of the earth in what we believe to be, fallaciously believe to be, the old Roman Empire. That old Roman Empire is 2,000 years old now. It's only under the control of the papacy, the man of sin. Caesars were blocking his way to power. But when they were taken out of the way, the man of sin was revealed. We don't need anyone to tell us who the Antichrist is. We know who he is. The scripture tells us who he is, and history proves it beyond any doubt whatsoever. And that in anybody believes any different than the Protestant reformers have taught us, they are deluded. They are deluded with futurism which tells us all that the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, is not the Pope, but a single individual that doesn't come until the end of time. That is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. It's time for us all to forget it. It's time to remove the pastors and priesters that occupy the pulpits of God's churches and replace them with true Bible-believing, spirit-filled, God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians. And quit this futurist nonsense. If there's anything left to be fulfilled of Daniel's prophecy, Jesus is not Messiah the Prince. We are yet in our sins. Now, is that what we want? I want to put Christ on his rightful throne. But before we can do that, we've got to get these Jesuit trained priesters out from behind the pulpits of our churches so the truth can be heard once and for all. And if we can't do it, if we don't have the muster to do it, then we have to depart from the churches. Ichabod! Take our shoes off, kick the dirt off our feet, and go have a house church somewhere in the desert, somewhere in the, in the woods, somewhere underground, so we can tell the truth and know the truth Back to you, York. 
Everything that Tom just said and everything that we said all together in the study is based on the Bible. And Tom can speak until, quote unquote, the cows come home, or I can do the same. If you don't study the Word of God and will get your own understanding by the leading of the Holy Spirit of the true Word of God, which is in English to be found in the AV 1611 King James Bible, then our words are spoken in vain, then these videos are done in vain, then this time that we spend on producing these videos is a, a waste of time. You have to do your own study. You have to read your Bible to get your own understanding and then confirm what you understand out of your own study of the Bible. Hold that against what we say in these videos. And if what we say in these videos holds up to your study, when you do a diligent study under the leading of the Holy Spirit of the King James Bible, what holds up then? That is truth. So until next time, please read your Bible. Maranatha. Oh